All right, guys. Hi. Um, I wanted to, I want to go ahead and record. Uh, this is essentially the recorded lecture for the biceps and glenoid uh, that we're going to do. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get this shared, and I will keep it not minimized that way you guys can see it. I learned my lesson last time. Okay, so we're going to get into the bicep uh, glenoid labrum and shoulder stability. Okay, um, so I want so obviously. We're not going to meet tomorrow via Zoom. I want you guys to spend time with this material um, and digest it, okay? But let's go ahead and just walk through this lecture together, okay? Okay, so guys, ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, the function of the labrum, okay, as we'll learn here in just a minute, <laughs> in just a minute <clears throat> sorry for coughing, is to enhance the stability of the shoulder, right? Deepen the shoulder socket and enhance stability. But the one thing that we've talked about already in class is that the labrum itself is not a standalone structure, right? Um, as we can see in this picture, the long head of the bicep actually comes in and attaches on the labrum. Um, it comes in and attaches on the labrum at about at about the 11 o'clock position. Um, and uh, essentially, um, you know, the, the bicep is essentially you know, attaches at, at, at the superior aspect, right? And that actually kind of helps us uh, with obviously shoulder stability as well, but with, with dynamic stability particularly. But the, the, the other thing that we'll see here shortly is that the bicep can actually also be implicated in pathology. So you can see in these pictures that the bicep um, can tear away from the labrum like it's done here over here in picture C, okay? This is actually a type four slap. All right, and then there's also obviously a type two as well, which involves essentially tearing of the bicep anchor. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you look at this, <clears throat> okay, here are some pictures on the right-hand side. Here is the, the nice black glenoid labrum sitting on the edge of the glenoid, okay? Just like this. There's a lot of fluid in the shoulder, though. This is actually a CT. Um, <clears throat> so this is actually here in the middle, a picture inside of the shoulder. And you can see the surgeon just kind of just gently probing the labrum. You can see this white, smooth, beautiful tissue. Okay, that's the labrum. We're, we'll, and we'll see more videos of that in the coming uh, weeks. All right, we'll look at we'll look at uh, surgeries actually in more in more detail. Um, so obviously here we have the glenoid uh, and the, the humeral head with uh, kind of a picture of the labrum here. Okay. So this obviously, as we know, is what makes up the ball and socket of the shoulder. Okay, so uh, really it's, you know, conceptualized like a ball on a tee uh, or like a, like a golf ball on a tee, um, but with a nice cartilage ring around the, the uh, glenoid to enhance stability. We remember from our, uh, for the first lecture of the class that we have our scapula here, our humerus here. This is obviously uh, in a human fetus and that our glenoid actually develops from the inner zone. So our glenoid, we can actually see kind of the outpouching here of the bone uh, with the labrum actually originating uh, from the, the, the thickened portion of the inner zone here. Okay, so here's the deal, guys. Let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the labrum, right? Um, and, and kind of what it does. So obviously, as we just said, the labrum, it's, its job is to deepen the shoulder socket and enhance stability of the shoulder. Okay, so... <clears throat> Sorry, when we look at when we look at the at the labrum itself, it's generally thicker at the top, so thicker at the superior aspect. Okay, it's approximately 11 millimeters thick, uh, and then at the inferior aspect, it's actually the thinnest, about two millimeters. Um, so, as we can see, you know, average depth of the labrum is between five and nine millimeters at the mid portion, uh, and that increases the depth of the glenoid. Right. So, if I had a ball, if I had my humeral head. Uh, on you know my my glenoid without a labrum it would just be it would slide around quite a bit but the job of the labrum is to essentially cup the humeral head right and allow for more stability particularly with dynamic motion um, as we move into flexion extension external rotation so on and so forth all right so as we know right as we've already kind of said the bicep attaches at the at the superior labrum at the superior tubercle generally at about the 11 o'clock position right and we know that the bicep muscle in the arm has two heads 
bicep, two heads. The short head goes and attaches on the coracoid, while the long head travels up into the shoulder, makes a 90 degree turn, and attaches on the super on the superglenoid tubercle. <clears throat> All right. So when we think about the labrum, guys, we need to think we need to think about the labrum, the, the labrum rather, as oriented like a clock face. Okay. It's almost kind of like a clock. So at the superior part, we have our 12 o'clock. Okay, at the anterior section. How do we know this is anterior? Because we have our cor our uh, coracoid here. Okay, we have our nine o'clock position, six o'clock position at the humor at the humeral shaft, and then back here, here's our chromium, three o'clock position. So twelve, um, basically, basically, you know, we'll call it one here. Okay, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Right, and that the bicep tendon is going to kind of come up and attach right there on the tuberculinar tubercle. Okay. So anytime we think about the labrum, it's going to be a lot easier to comprehend it if we think about it like a clock face from 12 to six. So from 12 all the way around. Okay. All right. So what about injuries to the labrum? How do injuries to the labrum happen? How do injuries to the long head of the bicep happen? So there are two main ways, right? Generally, we're going to have repetitive microtrauma, right? And that that most often applies um, in a lot of our overhead athletes, right? Um, so, you know, we're going to see a lot of overhead, a lot of basically adaptation in our overhead athletes, and we're going to have a lot of capsular tightness that actually changes the position of the emerald head. And we'll talk more about that uh, in class. But it changes the position of the emerald head and places more stress in the labrum, which can result in what's called a slap lesion. Okay, and a slap lesion, as you can see here, and it's in the next slide as well, stands for superior labrum, anterior to posterior. Okay, generally that describes anatomical position, but know that in a lot of our overhead athletes, our throwers and swimmers, right, slap lesions are going to be a lot more common. Okay, a lot more common in overhead in overhead athletes. On the flip side, okay, injuries to the labrum and long head of the bicep can also take place after subluxation or dislocation. Okay, so traumatic labral injuries can can happen, you know, in football, uh, soccer, you know, what have you know what have you, um, due to you know a traumatic injury, a blow, fall on the shoulder, so on and so forth, right? And usually too, when we have um, Traumatic labral injuries, along with them, uh, comes injuries to the glenohumeral ligaments as well, right? And we'll talk more about that here in the next couple slides. So a bank heart lesion is tearing of the anterior inferior glenohumeral glenohumeral labrum or ligament rather, along with the anterior inferior labrum. So if we go back to our clock face, let's just go back for the sake of illustration. Our slap lesion, okay. It's going to take place here from about, we'll call it maybe 10 to 2, okay? Whereas our bank heart lesion is going to take place down here between 6 and 9. So superior labrum, anterior to posterior, between about 10 and 2 or 9 and 3. And then we have our bank heart lesion between 6 and 9, okay? A reverse bank heart between 6 and 3, okay? So slap lesion at the top. Bank heart between six and nine, reverse bank heart between three and six. We call it a reverse bank heart because those generally happen in posterior dislocations. All right, slap lesions like we've been talking about. Okay, these are very common in overhead athletes, uh, as we know. Okay, slap stands for superior labrum, anterior to posterior. So. Uh, you know, utilizing that clock face analogy, these are going to happen between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. All right. They can be traumatic, but usually these are more going to be repetitive microtrauma and, you know, not really have a traumatic event attached. Right. Um, now, really important. <coughs> sorry, really important that in overhead athletes, these slap lesions, um, tend to take place because the posterior and inferior capsule of the shoulder 
tends to tighten right after you know re repetitive throwing motion and that actually changes the position of the humeral head causing it to be pressed up into the superior labrum and put more stress on the superior labrum that ultimately results in a tear okay that's called the the, the peel back mechanism sorry guys this thing's fussing at me stay in the call um let me go back all right oh doggy okay here we go all right so that peel back mechanism right so as the humerus begins to basically move anteriorly as it's pushed up anteriorly and kind of and abuts against the top of the labrum as we throw the humerus translate forwards and backwards forwards and backwards forwards and backwards ultimately until the labrum begins to peel away uh from this from the top of the glenoid okay and that's called the peel back mechanism okay um and so that causes the bicep tendon and the labrum to peel away from the uh, from the glenoid and sometimes the bicep, the bicep tendon will even actually detach from the labrum uh prior to the glenoid tearing so <coughs> one thing that we know guys is that um in overhead athletes right now i'm gonna i'm gonna show you guys this in a minute in overhead athletes over time the posterior and inferior capsule tighten right which increases the contact pressure on the superior labrum all right and that causes the humeral head to be pushed upwards into the superior labrum and a little bit posteriorly and if we remember right if we remember our force couples from the beginning of the of the semester or from a couple weeks ago we know that in order for maximal stability that humeral head should sit right smack in the center of the glenoid because the function of the rotator cuff is to depress the humeral head into the glenoid right that's what it does so ultimately we can see here okay and this is essentially a cadaveric model but here's the emerald head okay and if you look real close <clears throat> this is going to say this is the subscapularis here so there's the attachment there okay this is your bicep tendon going out of the bicep supraspinatus infraspinatus is back here and then your teres minor is down here okay but they didn't label it um so here's the glenoid okay now in an overhead athlete as we said the the position of the humerus gets pushed upwards into the labrum okay and if we look at this labrum we can see this this nice circle okay and these white dots but if you look if you follow that labrum around and look real carefully the one thing that you're going to notice when we get to the superior labrum and then as we tend to migrate posteriorly look how you kind of almost kind of junky and attenuated the tissue looks back here it looks like it's begun to peel away from the from the glenoid a bit okay this is actually the beginning of what we call the peel back mechanism okay and so you can see that when the emerald head is pushed upwards into the glenoid that the labrum begins to essentially kind of ever so slightly attenuate or peel away from the glenoid okay and that my friends is how slap lesions occur in overhead athletes okay that is the main mechanism for for injury in our red athletes so baseball volleyball right softball you name it that that that's how this generally happens the good news is is if we pick up on it soon enough there's actually things that we can do to actually treat it okay to try and hopefully prevent uh the occurrence of a slap tear all right so there are actually different types of slap tears okay um and I'm not going to make you guys memorize these, um, but what I do want you to know, right, is that I know I want you to know the difference between a type one and a type two, right? And so type three and type four. <clears throat> Sorry, my fingers went kind of crazy there and decided to do their own thing. So type one is basically a, a degenerative tear, right? A little bit of wearing away of the labrum, uh, sometimes due to trauma and or due to essentially uh, essentially retroversion of the humeral head so the humerus being in that posterior superior position that we that we talked about okay a type 2 slap is obviously detachment of the superior labrum uh, and bicep tendon from the glenoid okay um, type 3 is a bucket handle tear uh, 
And that's actually where the labrum actually, uh, almost kind of like a bucket handle meniscus, tears away and then flips into the joint space, right? And then type four, uh, bucket handle tear, uh, with all, also with subsequent uh, detachment of the bicep. So just remember that in type two and type four, the bicep anchor is affected. And in types one and type three, the bicep anchor remains intact, okay? And you can actually see here the bicep tendon and, and the labral tear. You can see how, this, how the labrum here is actually kind of drifted downwards uh, into, the, in, into the glenoid uh, here as well. All right, guys, let's get a little bit more nitty gritty on shoulder stability, okay? We already know that in order for me to have maximal shoulder stability, ideally my humeral head should sit right in the center of my glenoid, right? But there are ligaments that actually connect, <clears throat> that actually connect the glenoid labrum, so the labrum to the humeral head, right? And those ligaments are called my glenohumeral ligaments. All right, so here are, here's the long head of the bicep coming in at about 11 o'clock, okay? So, and here, this is essentially a little bit of a, a difference in terminology. So here it's called, in this picture, it's called the superior glenohumeral ligament. So anterior glenohumeral ligament here, here it's called superior, and technically these are all anterior. So superior glenohumeral ligament, middle glenohumeral ligament, and inferior glenohumeral ligament, okay? So... When we when we talk about the bank heart lesions, guys, I totally skipped a slide, but I'll go back. That's fine. I'll actually move that right now to down here, which helps. Just, sorry, I'm talking to myself, you guys. Um, so ultimately, those ligaments connect the emerald head to the labrum, okay? And so they provide stability. But what about a bank heart lesion? What happens here? Okay, we can see, <clears throat> pardon me, that here's that anterior inferior labrum. So there's 12, there's six, okay? And here is, my friends, here's, uh, we'll call it three. Yep, and nine. So here's my here's my, my bank heart between essentially three and six here, anterior inferior labrum. Okay, here's my bicep, superior glenohumeral ligament, ligament, middle glenohumeral ligament, and inferior glenohumeral ligament. The one thing that you'll notice, guys, <coughs> sorry, about the anatomy is that these ligaments are actually parts of the joint capsule here that are just, that are simply thickened and redundant, almost kind of like they're folded over on top of each other. Okay, bicep tendon up here, superior glenohumeral ligament, middle glenohumeral ligament, inferior glenohumeral ligament, okay, the anterior band and the posterior band. All right, and there's our bank heart lesion right there. So surgically, what they do to fix these bank heart lesions is they will go in, put anchors into the glenoid, and they will essentially tie the labrum back down to the glenoid, right? And then they will also do what's called an inferior capsular shift, where they take the capsule uh, and they basically kind of uh, basically sew it a little bit upwards and tighten it to bring the humeral head back into the center of the glenoid, okay? So there's that slide again, okay? Superior glenohumeral ligament, middle glenohumeral ligament, okay, inferior glenohumeral ligaments, anterior band and posterior band, and there's our labrum. So we can see the labrum is connected to the to the humeral head via the glenohumeral ligaments. Okay, so what happens, guys? What happens when the shoulder becomes unstable, right? When we have a subluxation or a dislocation? What's the difference between those two things? So a subluxation is essentially dissociation of one end of the joint away from the other with immediate unassisted relocation back into the joint. So if someone tells you, if you're on the sideline at a football game or maybe even a hockey game, right, and they say, you know, they come off, they're like, oh, can you look at my shoulder? Yeah, you know, it, it popped out and then it popped back in. If they say that it popped out and popped back in on its own, right, and that's what they tell you, that is a subluxation, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. But conversely, if the shoulder comes out, if the, if, if the humerus uh, dissociates, if, if the shoulder dislocates and stays out, right, and does not go back in on its own, 
and someone has to put the shoulder back into the socket or reduce the shoulder, right? That is a dislocation. <clears throat> so the shoulder's out and stays out and has to be put back in. So subluxation, the shoulder popped out and popped back in. Dislocation, the shoulder pops out and stays out and has to be manually relocated by an athletic trainer or physician. Okay. All right. Here's the deal, though, guys. With our dislocations and subluxations, right, ultimately there are other injuries that can occur, right, uh, along with those. And we're going to talk about those in a second. So one of the big ones uh, that we'll talk about is obviously rotator cuff tears. But the huge one, right, and we kind of, we've kind of been harping on this a little bit, but the huge one is the axillary nerve injury. So we've, we've talked a lot about that axillary nerve, the sensation over the lateral shoulder, the sheriff's patch. Can they set the deltoid, right? Can they contract the deltoid against your, thing, against your, elf or your hand, right? That tells us that the axillary nerve is, is, is intact and working because ultimately with our dislocations or subluxations, we can actually sustain damage to the axillary nerve after a shoulder subluxation or dislocation. So it is imperative, it is vital that after any history of subluxation or dislocation, that we always check the axillary nerve every time without fail, right? Got to check that axillary nerve. Can, do they have sensation over the lateral shoulder? And can they set the deltoid, okay? The other type of injury that we're going to talk about in just a second is a hill sax lesion. And that's actually where the humerus, okay, actually uh, almost sustains, almost kind of like a fracture or a bony depression uh, when it uh, essentially leaves the joint space and then relocates, right? I'll show you that here in a second, right? And then we know the most common uh, being the bank heart lesion, right? But, which is that tear of the, of the anterior inferior labrum, but we know, remember, that the labrum is attached to the inroll head through, through the glenohumeral ligaments. So, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little a little marker here for a second. I'm just, I'm just gonna click off of this for two seconds here, because um, what I want to show you, maybe. Sorry, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Uh, I need to find a little a thingy. Oh, oh, that's okay. Um, all right, there it is. So we are, we're back. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> so ultimately with the, with the glenohumeral ligaments, when when and if they tear, okay, there are different types of lesions that we can have. So, for example, let's say that we have a bank heart lesion, and also during that dislocation, that middle glen that uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament tears off of the humerus, but remains attached at the glenoid. Okay, so we call that humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament a Hagel lesion. H humeral A avulsion. G, glenohumeral, L, ligament, haggle, a haggle lesion. So if the ligament tears off the humerus, that's a haggle lesion, okay? But conversely, all right, if we have tearing of the ligament off of the glenoid, okay, and it's intact on the humerus, that is a gaggle lesion, a glenoid avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, okay? So those are, those are terms to be aware of. All right, folks. So we've, we we said that, you know, at, at the beginning of the lecture, a shoulder dislocation is a very violent mechanism. Okay, subluxation and dislocation are, are high energy violent mechanisms. So ultimately, uh, when that happens, right, we already said that there can be bony consequences as well. So um, there are times where when we tear that glenohumeral ligament, Okay, off of the glenoid, and you can see that here, that we actually evolve part of the glenoid with the ligament. Okay, and when the part of the glenoid tears off uh, with the ligament, that's actually called a bony bank heart. Okay, so you can see here, up here in the top picture is your is just your 
your basic bank art lesion without any bony detachment. But you can see down here in the bottom picture, um, <coughs> detachment of the uh, anterior glenoid. Uh, and that's called a bony bank art. Now, also though, the humerus at times can also be affected. After dislocation, we talked about the Hill-Sax lesion. Okay, so here's the crazy thing. Up here in this picture with the, the scapula and the humerus, we've got these four, these four guys here. Okay, top left, we have a normal <coughs> glenohumeral joint here with the humeral head and the scapula, or the humeral head and the glenoid. Okay, um, okay normal stability and maximal external rotation. But, okay, after a dislocation, one thing we notice about uh, about the glenoid. So here's actually, if you look at this picture, okay, here's greater, here's greater tuberosity, here's lesser, there's your bicipital groove. But if you look here on the other side, here's our humeral head, there's a giant honking dent or defect in the humerus, and that's called a hill sax lesion, okay? And so ultimately, when that, when the humeral head slides out of the glenoid and then slides back in, right? Um, that actually can cause a bony defect or depression of the humerus, uh, often leaving a bony fragment somewhere inside of the shoulder. That is called a hill sax lesion. Here's the problem. Uh, sometimes you don't have to do really do anything with a hill sax lesion um, if, it's, if it's not painful, if it's asymptomatic. But here's the problem. Sometimes when people try to internally and externally rotate, that hill sax lesion can actually you know, do what's called engage or almost kind of get hung or stuck on the anterior rim of the glenoid, okay? So oftentimes, if that hill sax lesion gets hung or engages on the anterior aspect of the glenoid, uh, that can actually cause uh, deficits in range of motion and subsequent like subluxation events or instability events because the patient can actually also feel uh, that the shoulder is continuing to dislocate and that can be very painful. So, in the event that the shoulder dislocates posteriorly, uh, if a hill sax lesion occurs in the event of a posterior dislocation, that's actually called a reverse hill sax. Okay, so hill sax lesion, anterior dislocation, reverse hill sax, posterior dislocation. And the vast majority of our dislocations, guys, are going to be anterior dislocations. Those are the most common. Uh, posterior dislocations are honestly a lot more rare or don't happen as often. All right, what about the cuff though, guys? There can be obviously consequences to the rotator cuff as well, all right? So ultimately when we have a slap tear or even a bank heart lesion, ultimately we lose shoulder stability, right? So then what happens is maybe with a slap tear or with a bank heart, uh, the emerald head starts to drift upwards, right? And oftentimes the emerald, the emerald head can rub on the underside of the rotator cuff tendon and, and to kind of thereby create a tear. Okay. So those tears, okay, and what we're gonna and we're gonna learn a little bit more about this. Uh, but the humeral head will drift upwards and begin to kind of grate against the, the rotator cuff and can create a partial thickness tear. Now, those partial thickness tears can be can be divided into essentially tears at the bursal aspect. So here's the bursa in this picture. So on the side that's closest to the bursa, that's called the bursal side of the tendon. But on the underside here, it's closest to the joint, that's called the articular okay, surface or side of the tendon. So we can have a posta lesion, which is a essentially a partial avulsion of, uh, of the supraspinatus tendon, uh, right? On the articular side of the of, of the of the cuff tendon, right, and then in some cases, and this is generally goes with age, uh, we can have a full thickness rotator cuff tear as well, where the entire tendon tears off and then retracts and kind of pulls backwards and generally kind of sits around the glenoid. Then we have to go in and grab it and pull it back and reattach it to the bone. <clears throat> we'll talk about that more in, in uh, our rotator cuff uh, lectures. All right. So here's the thing, guys. The bottom line, right, is the more often, okay, the the more often that someone subluxes or dislocates, okay, so 
with the with increasing number of subluxations or dislocations increases the chance that the person will have to have surgery okay to fix any de any 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 defects like a bank heart and or even maybe a, a bony bank heart right so here's the thing though there are there are times where people that have repeat dislocations or subluxations can excuse me can actually lose bone Right, the bone can actually get get kind of ground down, um, and the bone can actually lose um, part of basically the the anatomical shape at the anterior aspect, and the shoulder can essentially become extremely unstable. Right, so ultimately, uh, conventional wisdom has essentially said that you know any more than 20 to 25 percent bone loss at the anterior glenoid, right, uh, means that we have to have surgery. Uh, to essentially repair the uh, or build in new bone, okay? And I'll show you that here in a second. There's a procedure uh, that we utilize called a ladder J procedure uh, to build in that bony stability once it's been lost. Uh, conservative estimates, though, and this is actually a study that was conducted in, Ch uh, in China uh, by some Chinese investigators, and they actually uh, found that uh, estimates as low as 15% uh, of, of glenoid loss can actually necessitate surgery, okay? So let me just kind of show you what I'm talking about here. So if we lose bone, okay, at the anterior surface of the glenoid, we've got that crazy hill sac lesion being a, being a bugaboo, and it just won't leave us alone, okay? And it's engaging on the anterior aspect of the glenoid, right? Oftentimes, if, we, if we've lost enough stability, you can see how the inter uh, glenoid just kind of glenoid here has just kind of been worn down. What they will often do is they will go in, they'll open up the shoulder, and they will saw the tip off of the coracoid and relocate that to the anterior glenoid. Okay, and what that actually does by transferring the coracoid, um, it actually creates more anterior stability to the shoulder, uh, preventing anterior dislocation. Right, because ultimately, if the emerald head tries to leave the joint, it's going to meet a bony block, uh, being the part of the coracoid there. Okay. Um, as we already talked about, right, the hill, you know, hill sac lesions can be very debilitating um, because they can actually engage or get hung on the anterior glenoid and create instability events and subluxation, right, and they can be extremely painful. So. I want to introduce this, guys, and, and we'll talk more about this. We're going to get into this actually fairly in depth when we get into rehab, uh, treatment and rehab of the shoulder. So right now, guys, there are four main classifications uh, for shoulder instability. The first one, okay, uh, and they're they're all acronyms, which is pretty pretty amazing. Um, I have a kind of a kind of a joke that kind of helps us remember this. It's Two friends that went to the mall and their names are their names are Ambry and Tubbs. I'll, I'll, I'll tell that joke later. But ultimately, K Ambry is an acronym that stands for acquired instability. Okay, this is gonna you're gonna see this a lot in your gymnasts, your volleyball players, your swimmers. Okay, so something that they've acquired over time. Generally, it's multidirectional, meaning that the shoulder feels unstable. Right in many directions, it feels like it feels unstable anteriorly, posteriorly, superiorly, in, superiorly, inferiorly. It's very just kind of loosey goosey and mobile, right? Usually, this is bilateral instability, and usually we treat this with rehab. So, generally speaking, we, we can treat this with rehabilitation. Now, the I, though, in Ambry, uh, basically tells us that if surgery is, re is required, we would do an inferior capsular shift uh, to tighten the shoulder, right, and, and restore stability. Uh, tubs, on the other hand, okay, these are going to be your people that have had three, four, you know, two, three, four, five shoulder dislocations, have a bank heart, and maybe even have that bony loss of the anterior glenoid, right? So they, they have a type of instability called tubs. I love tubs, right? T-U-B-S, tubs, right? So that is traumatic. Okay, so that's subluxation or dislocation. It's traumatic, unilateral. Okay, happens on generally on one side. Okay, and 
generally is associated with a bank heart lesion or a bony bank heart and or bone loss at the glenoid, right? And the treatment there is surgery. We'll go in and we'll do a, essentially do a, a bank heart repair with a capsule orthy, with a capsular shift. Uh, but if that is unsuccessful, then we may have to consider a ladder J. Okay. Um, so a couple others, and we're going to talk, we're, we're going to talk about this a lot uh, in rehab, right? In, in the rehab section of the shoulder. So there's, there's essentially a, a IOS. Okay. That's a third classification of instability. That's relatively new. And this is actually in our overhead athletes. Okay. So like, like your Ambry, this is also acquired, right? Um, and the shoulder can become unstable, right? But it's generally not grossly unstable, right? And this generally happens in overhead athletes and in overhead positions, right? And generally, we we treat this uh, with shoulder surgery, particularly with either a capsular shift or type where we tighten the capsule down, uh, and we might have to fix a slap a slap tear as well. Okay, so AIOS is in is in your overhead athletes. Okay. And then we'll and then we will also often sometimes see uh, basically micro or minor instability uh, that's just simply causing pain that can cause things like impingement and other types of pathologies. So AMSI, a traumatic, so nothing happened, no trauma, it's minor, okay, uh, and it's instability that essentially uh, becomes symptomatic just based off of very basically micro movement or very minor movement, okay. Uh, and there is, there is essentially micro shoulder instability uh, in that population. So four types of, of instability, AMBRI, TUBS, AIOS, and AMSI. AMBRI, TUBS, AIOS, and AMSI. And we're gonna, we, we will dig more into that um, when we talk about rehab, okay, when, when we get into the rehab section. Okay, thank you guys so much for hanging in there and and uh, this will be up shortly. Thanks, guys.